However, the story doesn't end there. Because 3,000 miles away, in America, the director enabled Chippendale to live on. This is Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia. It recreates life as it would have been in the 18th century British colony. The people who lived in this new and untamed land were desperate for a taste of British Chippendale-style elegance. And there's a museum here full of 18th century American furniture made to director designs. That would have decorated the homes of figures like George Washington. The Chippendale style in the 18th century in America was seen as a, an English style. The people in America in the late colonial period thought of themselves as British, and so they saw London as the center of the fashion world. In each of the different colonies along the seaboard, it was interpreted in a different way. For example, in the Philadelphia area, Chippendale's designs are very florid and very richly carved. Whereas in Virginia, the cabinet makers here and the householders ordering the furniture tend to take a plainer, neater, less ornamental style. Williamsburg even has an 18th century furniture workshop, making Chippendale designs and using only the tools that would have been available to him. Master craftsman Mac Headley is creating a Chippendale style candle stand. We're working on a project replicating a pair of four foot tall candle stands that George Washington had made for Mount Vernon uh, for his dining room. They believe a uh, design done by Thomas Chippendale. Working with the grain of the wood, I've got my outline of the design. That gives me break points where I can then begin to remove material. Pretty satisfying when it comes together. The director, originally written to entice 18th century Londoners, was now a global phenomenon. Thomas Jefferson had a copy in America. So too did Catherine the Great at the Hermitage in Russia. And Louis XVI in the Palace of Versailles. What Chippendale did with the director was truly remarkable. He created the first international brand. In a way, the director was the lifestyle catalogue of his day. He set off something which ended up in the Habitat catalogue, in the IKEA catalogue. He produced something which celebrated his work. Chippendale was one of the first to make the idea of a brand, for furniture especially, which could be copied, could be understood and recognized by many people. At its strongest, a brand is something that turns base metal into gold or raw wood into Chippendale furniture, something that uh, transcends the individual maker. Chippendale's designs still pop up in the strangest places, from skyscrapers to stamps and, of course, in modern chair design. In Scotland, the next generation of furniture makers still find Chippendale's legacy inspirational. And the market for handcrafted furniture is enjoying a revival. The ethos of the school 
is to have students coming from around the world to here to learn about Chippendale, but to learn what Chippendale would be doing today. He would be making new, exciting, vibrant furniture, which is what he was doing at that time. The students here are keeping Chippendale's skills alive through their work, from heavy planing to delicate gilding. If you ask anyone in the street, Chippendale, his name is right out there. It's the one name that people have always heard. For all his fame and all the copies, the furniture made by Chippendale himself is incredibly rare. And any piece is worth serious money. Sales are not common, but when they happen, records are smashed. In 2010, the Harrington commode, attributed to Chippendale, became the most expensive piece of English furniture sold at auction. It's very rare for, extremely rare, for a piece of provenanced, documented furniture by Thomas Chippendale to appear on the market. But we don't know yet how many more there may be. Back in 1924, I think there were only 14 clients known. And in 1968, we still only discovered another 12 or so. Now we know there are 68. Now that accounts for 700 pieces of Chippendale furniture. There might be another house somewhere. One such property hit the market in 2007 when the contents of Dumfries House in West Scotland came up for sale. It was a perfectly preserved time capsule, full of pristine Chippendale furniture. Christie's Auction House produced this double volume catalogue containing every piece in the house. At eye watering prices. But this furniture was never sold. The collection was dramatically saved at the 11th hour by the Prince of Wales, who helped to find the 45 million pounds needed to save it. Charlotte Rostec looks after this furniture today. It's as perfect as when it was first made, and each piece carries a hefty price tag. You know, when we stand in front of this furniture, it's a work of art. They're priceless. If you just think of the price ticket that this bookcase had when it was prepared for auction, it was said to go between uh, two to four million, but experts thought it would have gone for much, much more money than that. And this just shows you how close we came to lose this bookcase to an auction. Number 40 in the catalogue. And we have these side doors here. I'm just going to pull this open gently. We don't open this very often. And in fact, I don't think this has been op uh, opened very often throughout its entire life. Because if you look, it's absolutely immaculate. Indeed, sometimes when we show this to people, they can't quite believe that these are the original handles because they look spanking new. And of course, it also still works. It pulls out as though it was made yesterday. Absolutely amazing. And we want to keep it that way for at least another 250 years. The longer one works with it and, you know, talking about it and observing it and explaining it to people, 
you, you really almost develop a relationship with it. And in some cases it's almost, I would say, a sensual relationship because of all these wonderful curves and I do have the privilege of moving and touching and uh, sometimes stroking it. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing and you, you really get under its skin. I can only say that if there was one of those things from Dumfries, any of those things had been uh, sold, had come up for auction, whatever it made wouldn't have been enough. It would not have been enough. Suddenly it's, it's not a wardrobe or a clothes press, it's, it's something by Chippendale. And, and of that quality and of that stature that makes it important as well as, I just wonderful, I mean you just, just sit there and look at it. <laughs> No recession in English furniture would have any connection with Thomas Chippendale any more than, say, there were a recession or a dip in the British landscape market would have to do with Constable. It would be totally unaffected. They are miles apart, worlds apart. And the market for the best has always, always been maintained. And he was the best. He was a master at his craft. You can't beat that. We have the name of Chippendale and what it embodies. It embodies Englishness, it embodies um, a notion of excellence and it embodies a style which everybody recognises. Quite apart from being objects of design, these are little works of art in their own right. We will know in 300 years time, in a thousand years time, we will know Chippendale's name. Why? Because he's already done 250 years. In the next episode, from the ashes of the Fire of London, emerged our greatest ever woodcarver. Grinling Gibbons decorated the finest buildings in Britain and transformed wood into pure art. <laughs>